Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Dwight Ackerman, review of Myopia Management Editor. And we're going to be speaking about treating myopia holistically. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Well, thank you for joining us again for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. We're here with uh, Dr. Dwight Ackerman. And uh, Dwight, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Dave. Absolutely. Now, uh, Dwight has, uh, as, as we just discussed in the, in the intro, is uh, heading up a uh, review of myopia management. And after a uh, very lengthy career in uh, the eye care world. I think you 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 did you were in practice and so forth for ten years. What was the first ten years after graduation like before you entered the Ciba Novartis Elcon world? Well, after I graduated from the Illinois College of Optometry, I joined the contact lens only practice of Dr. Robert Ketting. Yes, and at the time, Dr. Ketting had the largest contact lens practice in the United States. Mm -hmm. His practice was limited to contact lenses. He was, he was truly a genius. And this I, was from just, 80 to 90. That, was, that yeah. was pretty innovative back then. It was unbelievable because, you know, most cool. optometric practices, you know, um, sell eyeglasses and, and uh, treat ocular disease and, and have a lot of ancillary services. Dr. Ketting's practice was contact lenses only. Wow. So it was a fantastic experience. Um, I, I learned you know, so much about contact lenses from him and about uh -huh. communication to patients. He was a master communicator. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. so that was, it was a fantastic experience. I then went off on my own and, in fact, opened my own practices for several years. Oh. Yeah. Before I decided to join industry, I thought, you know, it, it sounds interesting. It, it, it's a new challenge. It will help me develop new skills. So I joined uh, the contact lens industry after 10 years of practice. Yeah. And with a blink of an eye, with a blink of an eye, 30 years passed. And wow. uh, in 2019, I retired from Alcon. And yeah. since I retired from Alcon, I have uh, assumed the position as chief medical editor now, for tell us, review of how, myopia management. How did that come about, uh, this review of myopia management uh, project? How did, because uh, uh, I think many of my listeners are familiar with review mm -hmm. of myopia management. It's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think the, the largest uh, voice in myopia management today, and you're leading the charge. How did that all come about? Well, interestingly, uh, the last six or seven years I was at Alcon, I was responsible for the myopia strategy at Alcon. And uh, so I was deeply familiar with the category. I was deeply familiar with you know, all of the epidemiological data and all of the interventions that were being developed. Mm. Um, and so I, I really developed a passion for myopia and myopia management. I'm a high myope myself, so I understand, you know, the issues of, of myopia and high myopia personally mm -hmm. and, you know, the limitations it's placed on my life. And so when I retired, um, I was fortunate enough to have a, a conversation with Mark Ferrara and Bill Scott. As you know, Mark Ferrara is the CEO of Jobson, and mm -hmm. Bill Scott is the president of Jobson. And we were sitting around having a coffee at, um, I think it was the American Optometric Association about, what, when is that? 20, that would have been 2018, right? Would have, yeah, 2018, just prior to my retirement. And we started talking about future trends. And I said, the mega trend that is just starting to form is that myopia management is going to be a big place within the eye care field, both ophthalmology and optometry. I said, we're not there yet. This is 2018. There was nothing FDA approved at that point. But 
I can tell you from my previous work and my previous analysis, this category is going to be huge. It will rival dry eye, which has become a multi-billion dollar category you know, in the United States and, and globally. So Mark Ferrara and Bill Scott you know, are both visionaries, and they said, you are absolutely right. Let's do something about it. And so together, we created Review of Myopia Management. Mm -hmm. And long soon after my retirement, and as I said, I was named the founding chief medical editor. Yeah. So it's it's been a fantastic ride, and um, you know I think we've really done some great educational programs um, in RMM. Yeah. So um, I I think you have too, and you know I I, I wanted to touch on uh, an avenue. Of um, of of practice or of of the discussions that you've had recently, just in July here, you published a uh, a a column on the holistic mm -hmm. standpoint, and I was hoping you could kind of talk about that for us on the holistic approach. Right, some of us are going in mm -hmm. and we're talking about orthokeratology for your patients. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's other people that they talk about, hey, you know, stop reading so much. Uh, but mm -hmm. it really, I think you're right on. We need to approach this with many different angles. One of our previous guests, A. Vanderwart, uh, really spoke about how with myopia management, we're treating the patient, not the condition. And mm -hmm. we treat the condition the patient has, but all of those things come into it. And a big part of that is stopping the progression by slowing the cause. So mm -hmm. talk us through a little bit about this ho a holistic approach that you talked about. I think you started off talking about being proactive. Mm -hmm. I did. Well, th thank you for uh, acknowledging uh, my <laughs> editor's, editor's perspective yeah, in the review good. of myopia management. But I, I was compelled to write that uh, column because when I speak with colleagues around the world about myopia care for children, you know, it becomes evident that almost every eye care professional has a different definition of myopia management. They do. Uh, you know, many optometrists say, well, I manage myopia now. I perform a refraction and I, I prescribe single vision contact lenses or single vision spectacles. I manage myopia now. And, and so I felt it was important to talk about holistically what really is myopia management. It, it goes far beyond, you know, simple correction of refractive error. So, um, you know, the term myopia management uh, is sometimes synonymously used with myopia control or myopia care. But right. as I said, as a whole, I, just, I prefer the term myopia management. So myopia management, my definition is that it refers to proactively implementing a strategy to delay the incidence of myopia mm -hmm. or slow the progression of myopia in children. Mm -hmm. From a treatment perspective, myopia management is defined as slowing axial elongation, which yep. of course also reduces the rate at which the diopteric value of the refractive error increases. Um, I think most of of the listeners are aware that there are various treatments that have been sh shown in randomized controlled trials to slow the progression of myopia. Topical low dose atropine, novel spectacle designs, yep. center distance multifocals, uh, orthokeratology, uh, et cetera, have all been shown to slow axial elongation in myopic children. Mm -hmm. Um, at the moment, um, there are two products approved by the FDA for myopia control or myopia management. One is the CooperVision MySight uh, mm -hmm. soft multifocal contact lens. And the other, which was recently approved, is the AccuView Ability uh, orthokeratology lens, which has not been launched yet in the United States, but my understanding is it will be soon. But on the horizon, Dave, are a yep. lot of various products that are in various sure. sta stages of their uh, clinical trials 
and uh, various stages of the regulatory process. So if we looked into the future, four or five years from now, there will be multiple products in each category approved by the FDA is what I believe. So there'll be a lot more choices for the practitioner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But going back, going back to the holistic viewpoint of myopia management, I define myopia management with the following framework. One is in order to truly practice myopia management, uh, you have to be proactive, yeah. meaning you have to have an informed discussion with every pre-myopic or myopic child and their parents. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're examining a child, you know, and you identify that that child is pre-myopic, they are going to be myopic, in other words, um, or the child is already myopic. You, you have to take the time to discuss what is myopia and why you, as the eye care practitioner, are concerned about this myopia. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just brush it off as a benign refractive error, right. prescribe another prescribe another half diopter of minus to their glasses and send them on their way out to the optical dispenser. Yeah. So, so you've, you really got to have that informed discussion. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you, you, you're, you're dead on with that. You know, we do that in eye care in other arenas. We do that if we see some early drusen and we talk about macular degeneration, right? We're, you know, we have the pre-glaucoma that we have and we talk mm -hmm. about, you know, unless we get this handled, Glaucoma is going to damage your vision. And, you know, all across mm -hmm. the board with diabetes, we have the pre. Well, myopia, if we do classify it as a disease, does have a pre or does mm -hmm. have these risk factors. So talk to us a little bit about uh, what, what some of the risk factors are for, for leading you into that discussion for mm -hmm. those patients. Like pre-myopia, who are those patients that are at mm -hmm. higher risk? Mm -hmm. Well, that term pre-myopia really, really came in the CLEAR study yeah. that was, was done right. by Professor uh, Carla Zadnik and co-workers yeah. at The Ohio State University. And their seminal paper, which was published a, a few years ago, uh, showed that refractive error at various young ages was the single best indicator of whether that child was going to become myopic. Sure or not. was. Yeah. You know, Yep. So bottom line is, you know, without going into specific numbers, bottom line is, you know, young children from six through 11 years old should be hyperopic, yeah. you know, very, at various levels. They should be hyperopic. But if they are already plano or, so, you know, maybe a minus a quarter diopter myope, they are headed into myopia mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. So that, that's the clear study. Everyone should be familiar with that study. It yeah. was really an outstanding paper and really, really alerted the world to this concept of pre-myopia. Right. You know, and we know that uh, although genetics plays hardly any, if we you believe at all, any, any aspects of it, we know that if you have one parent who's myopic, you've got a three times risk and two, six times greater risk if both parents are. And we think yes. that's probably because you're doing similar things that your parents are doing. And if you've got both of them are myopic, it, it may be. So that's a risk factor right in and of itself. And then in addition to that, you know, we know that if you develop any level of myopia, any level at all before the age of six or seven, that you've got a 60, I believe it is a six to seven times greater risk of developing high myopia, yes. which just really puts you at risk factors you know, a 40 times greater risk factor for retinal detachment uh, for high myopes than versus, you know, somebody who didn't. So you're dead mm -hmm. on those, those early indicators really are mm -hmm. things that we need to talk about. And then what about these health risk benefits? What, what, uh, this axial elongation, how do you propose or, you know, recommend that we talk to parents about lowering that diopteric value? Like what is that mm -hmm. kind of conversation? And and, you know, taking from that holistic approach that you think mm -hmm. should be some key, key messages there on and talking mm -hmm. with the parent about that. Well, certainly uh, when you're discussing myopia, 
uh, with children and parents, you know, I don't think you want to lead with, you know, these long term eye health issues. <laughs> go blind. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Right. It, be, because, you know, the, that that is not the way that's not the way to start the conversation. Start. You don't start with fear. Right. Um, but but it is important that that, you know, at a point in your conversation, that you have to educate children and their parents about the long-term eye health risks associated yeah. with ax axial elongation and the advantages of a lower dioptic prescription. Right. Yeah. So, you know, um, uh, Jeff Walleen uh, published a paper a few years ago where, in fact, he talked about these advantages of a lower dioptic prescription. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he talked about the fact that, um, you know, you will be a better candidate if at some point you want LASIK, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you will have, uh, the children oftentimes have higher self-esteem if, if they're not, uh, you know, highly myopic. Right. Um, they, they oftentimes, um, you know, are, are perform better in sports. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there are lifestyle things that are very advantageous when you're a lower myope. And, you know, as you mentioned, Dave, you know, if a child is diagnosed with myopia when they're six, seven, eight, nine years old, you know, chances are they are going to become a high myo. They are going to be a fast progressor. And by the yep. time they're 18, 19 years old, they're going to be a minus five or minus six diopter myo. And it, it's that's what we want to avoid. We want to avoid high myopia because, as you mentioned, that's where the risk factors really escalate. Risk yeah. factors for Posterior subcapsular cataracts, glaucoma, retinal detachment, myopic macular degeneration. Right. So, so you really want to avoid high myopia and an axial length of less than 26 millimeters. So yeah. it's, you know, depending on the, on the uh, publication, some people say high myopia is minus five diopters. Some people define it as minus six diopters, whichever definition you use they're, they're indeed both high myopia but 26 millimeters has been the the number that number that re researchers have put the stake in the ground and said above 26 millimeters that's where you really run into the risk of, of these eye health problems that i've mentioned right and if you don't have an axial length that's way longer than that but you do have a high refractive correction for other reasons that you could have, not very often, you you don't run the same risk factors, right? You That's don't. kind of the big no. thing is we, uh, we're we not, and, and you and I have had this conversation before, but we're not quite at the point where we tell somebody you can't manage myopia without an axial length, but it is that instrument that is so key to the component of it. I would never want to say to my colleague, no, 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 you can't do any myopia management using any of these FDA or off-label products to, to help your patient base until you get an axial length measurement. But that's right. where you and I probably agree that five or seven years from now, there's a good chance that we're going to have these instruments in most offices, kind of like, Indeed. you know, back in the day, pre auto refractor, that was uh there was a day where it was like, okay, five yeah. years from now, everybody had <laughs> one. And I think that's going to be the direction we're going to be in the future. Same uh -huh. with OCT and glaucoma um, and, yes. and, and so forth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So let's talk oh. a little bit about the lifestyle and the hygiene Yes. components you know very, what are very some important. things about talking about there what, what so certainly we again from a holistic standpoint every child whether they're uh, emetropic premyopic or myopic you should have a discussion with every child and their parents about specific lifestyle and visual hygiene recommendations yeah to reduce the incidence uh, or, or progression of myopia so mm -hmm. what, what are those specific recommendations? So the first is um, that children should not hold their iPhone or iPad or other reading materials closer than 30 centimeters. So mm -hmm. 13, 14 inches. Uh, again, a number of peer reviewed publications have focused in on that working distance because oftentimes Wait, you'll see- I, 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 I want to mention, do you remember learning about Harmon distance? The Harmon distance, which was your elbow to your eye, 
And that's, yes. you know, for me, right around 30, you know, and most people it is. Yes. I've gone to some optometry school recently and I've talked about heart. Nobody knows what Harman distance is I, anymore. I remember but, that. <laughs> I do remember that. It's about 13 inches. So you should but, be. Yeah. But you know, again, it's it's amazing when I am, you know, walking in a mall or or you know, at an airport or in a restaurant, I see children with their iPhone and they are literally holding that about right six up to their away. face. So yeah. that so the first recommendation is have an appropriate working distance and no closer than uh, 30 centimeters. Number two, you know, this, well, many people talk about the 20, 20, 20 rule. I prefer, and I've written a, a column about this in review of myopia management. I prefer the 20, 22 rule, which is the rule that um, the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam has coined. They're a world, you know, leading center for myopia management. And they they have published on this and they prefer the 2022 rule versus 2020. So again, they're they're, they're similar, but they're different. So 2022 means that uh, every 20 minutes, a child should take a, at least a 20 second break and look into the distance and they should and importantly they need to spend at least two hours per day outdoors mm -hmm. so every 20 seconds or excuse me every 20 minutes take a break for at least 20 seconds gaze into the distance relax your eyes blink several times mm -hmm. go back to your near point work but make sure you get outside. These children today don't spend as much time outdoors as certainly we did when we were children. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't have to be two hours at a time. It can be 15 minutes here, 30 minutes there, an hour there. But the total amount of time spent outdoors in daylight should be at least two hours per day. Yeah. Hence 2022. Yeah, I like that. You know, uh, when I was growing up, my mom didn't hand me an iPad uh, when she was sick of me, right? She just kicked me outside and said, don't yeah. come back until dinner. <laughs> That's exactly right. right. Go ride your bicycle, Dave. That's right. Go Get ride out your of bicycle. Here. Go visit your friends. <laughs> now, uh, you're right. Many parents have hand their child an iPad or an iPhone yeah. and tell them to play games on there. So but, true. And but, that, that component of that outside is a real key component. And sometimes people think that it's all about the distance vision that happens when you're outside. And we, we've come to realize that, you know, myopia uh, progresses less in the summer and the spring, which could have something to do with, you know, vitamin D. There's all these concepts about it, but it's yes. more than just distance vision. Uh, it has something to do with that beautiful fire in the sky. Uh, yes. And its effect on our on our body. The light therapy is a big part of where the future is going in eye care. We've talked about syntonics, and mm -hmm. you know I've, I, we're we're doing a lot more research in that. And you know now we're using low level light therapy for dry eye. There could be something mm -hmm. about the sunlight that's helping uh, eye care all around, right? No and question. We know it to no be the question. case of myopia. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Totally agree with that, Dave. Yeah, yeah. And then. The the uh, final point, you know, again, with my holistic sure. definition of myopia management is right. that, that, you know, eye care professionals need to prescribe evidence-based interventions mm -hmm. to slow axial elongation and reduce what the risk What do you mean by developing. that? What, what, why are well, you saying it like that? Well, the reason I say that in my uh, next editor's perspective coming up on August 1st in review of myopia management uh, talks about this, that, that you know, many practitioners uh, are still prescribing uh, treatments that they believe are slowing the progression of myopia, but these treatments have have no randomized controlled trial data behind the behind them. So, for example, uh, many eye care professionals still prescribe uh, progressive addition lenses for myopic children, and yeah. you know that has been clearly shown not to be effective you know uh, large randomized mm -hmm. controlled trials have shown that that they have a 10 or 15 percent reduction in the progression of myopia but it's not considered clinically significant 
So right. that would be an, that would be an example of a, an intervention that is not evidence based. Sure. Uh, another one is under correction. You know, many many yep. practitioners still under correct myopic children, thinking that's going to slow the progression of myopia, where in fact it has just exactly the opposite effect. Yeah. So yeah. So you need to prescribe um, evidence based interventions such as again topical low dose atropine. Mm-hmm. Orthokeratology, dual focus or extended depth of focus, soft contact lenses, and again on the horizon are novel spectacle designs that have also been shown in two or three year randomized control trials yeah. to truly reduce the progression of myopia mm-hmm. in that fifty to sixty percent range. Yeah. So yeah, in the spectacle world, we've got studies that are coming out three year uh, data data mm-hmm. from. Uh, from China, um, the the DIMS and uh, you know Essler has a product, and you know you mentioned the mm-hmm. spectacle one, and I want to touch on that because way back in the early two thousands, there was a study by Folk where they showed a twenty percent reduction in the progression of nearsightedness, but there was a component about this with ESO posture, accommodative mm-hmm. dysfunction, and you know, unless mm-hmm. you're doing the appropriate testing to know what that is, and you can get yeah. that 20% reduction on that kiddo, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and, and it, why, why do 20% when you have all these treatments that can do 50, 60, 70, 80% with all the others? And that was just one study. There was another study by Edwards in 2002 that only showed a 3% slowing of the progression. So I'm right on with you. And to your point, Mm -hmm. Uh, Alder did a study in 2006, which under correction showed that you progressed in your myopia by 16%. You pointed that out. Chung did a study in 2002 Mm -hmm. where there was progression of 22%. So, you know, certainly something we don't want to be doing that. And I think there's this this perspective by a lot of our counterparts that under correction is still the way to go. And Mm -hmm. by all means, at least correct them where they need to be. And I've said that if you're not going to be uh, prescribing something to slow down the progression of myopia, see those progressive kids at least every six months so that you can modify their spectacle Mm -hmm. lenses, right? Because if you're undercorrected for six months of the year, these studies indicate that they actually are making you become more progressive, more progressed faster. Exactly. Right. So really, so exactly. key, I think that's so, so on top of it is that evidence based. And, you know, I had this conversation recently with a couple of really, really great people in, in, in our field, uh, b- both with AFE uh, as well as with Patrick Caroline on mm-hmm. um, all great research happens, starts in the exam room. And we have mm-hmm. these evidence based datas that are out there that show 50%, let's use that as a number of 50% reduction. Well, here's the thing. There may have been a child in that group who was still progressing rapidly and then a bunch of kids that weren't, and that's bringing that average down to 50%. Well, in clinic, we wouldn't let that kid go. We would do something right. to intervene. And so may, you know, with the appropriate targets, clinically, we're going to be getting our numbers fire higher than we would even in the evidence-based medicine because we're not mm-hmm. following a protocol. We're modifying based yeah. upon the expected returns that we're getting. And I think yeah. that's so key that we remember mm-hmm. that as clinicians, we're looking for the next best thing for our patients, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's why uh, you know clinicians need to monitor myo- myopic children at least every six months. You know, Once yeah. an intervention is started, you need to see that child. And if they're a non-responder, of course, you have to look at non-compliance, first of all. That's but true. It, it, mm-hmm. if ultimately you, you rule out non-compliance, then uh, it, you know, if, if they're continuing to progress as fast as they were prior to the intervention, you, know, you, you most likely need to change that intervention. And sure. Either add another intervention or change completely. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Great stuff, Dwight. I sure appreciate you uh, bringing your perspective here and bringing your perspective to us on a regular basis with review of myopia management. Um, Thank you for joining us. Uh, It was great to have you. Great to be here. And thank you again for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. 
Well, hey, and thank you for listening to this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Please stay tuned for future episodes. Make sure to like and subscribe so that we can just fill your inbox, fill your podcast uh, queue with all the great episodes that we have coming on. And if you would do us a favor and leave a five-star review, that'll help make sure that everybody gets access to the Myopia Podcast. Thank you for joining us again. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.